Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John. I'm from the, uh, the Scale Factory. I'm going to be uh, talking you through um, designing for uh, SaaS workloads on AWS. Uh, with me on the call this morning, uh, I've got Steve Dodds, who's one of my uh, solutions architects. He's going to be uh, keeping on the chat and answering any, any questions that you have in there um, and uh, making sure that uh, everybody's behaving themselves. Uh, we also have from uh, the Amazon Web Services uh, account management team, uh, Izzy Perkin and Ashley Williams. Um, Ash, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and, uh, and say something about the, uh, the account management uh, program of the team? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I uh, really appreciate your time. So I'm part of the ISV commercial team here at AWS. Uh, so is Izzy. We both have the same roles, and it's really about supporting ISVs and leveraging the breadth and depth of, of AWS services, but also, uh, where possible, helping you go to market, removing blockers, developing code build, market and sales strategies. Um, yeah, really happy for you guys to be here. If you're not sure on who your AWS account manager is, um, please reach out. We can make uh, we can make introductions either to myself or Izzy, or if you sit somewhere else in the ISV team, um, we can introduce you to your relevant rep. Um, so yeah, back to you, John. Cool, thanks, Ash. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen, and then we'll uh, we'll get started properly. Uh, this is. Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen there. Steve, give me a give me a yes or a no if uh... sounds good. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping before we uh, before we crack on. Um, so uh, this is uh, this is a Zoom webinar. If this is your first time using Zoom for webinars, there's a couple of uh, a couple of sort of things that you should know. Um, the um, if you have any questions as we go, um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you press that, a, a box will pop up um, and uh, you can type your question into, into that box. Um, I can see the Q&A box on my screen um, in the uh, event that um, the question looks relevant to what I'm talking about or I can segue. I will, I'll try and answer it um, while, I'm, while I'm in flow. Um, and uh, I will... Uh, Use the uh, use the question box to uh, to, to to try and uh, uh, answer questions as we go. Um, at the end of the session, um, there will be a, a, a more official Q and A section, so I might defer some of the questions until then. Um, you're also welcome to uh, to use uh, the chat box to uh, to ask questions. Steve will keep an eye on the uh, on the on the chat box um, and um, uh, and answer anything that, that's that's going on there. Um, I won't be paying attention there while we while we go. So uh, so um, I. Don't, uh, don't expect to, to hear anything from me uh, based on anything on thing you put in the, in the chat. Um, we are recording the webinar. Um, it's, uh, the recording is currently going. It will be available after, um, after we're finished. Um, I, I'm at this point unclear whether you get an automatic email from Zoom uh, with, a, with a webinar link uh, to, to watch the video back. Um, if, uh, if not, then you can email me after the, uh, after the webinar. I'll make sure you get access to that recording. Uh, I'll also make the slides available, so don't worry about making uh, copious notes. Um, these uh, these will be available as a PDF uh, to download uh, a little later today. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping today. Um, I'm, uh, I'm in my flat, obviously, like everybody else. Um, it's a lovely sunny day here in South East London. I hope it's, it's nice where you are as well. Um, I'm right by the front door um, and, the, uh, and the intercom, um, and uh, it's not unusual that the postie drops by sometime between now and 11 on a, on a weekday. So um, I might have to sort of uh, say, oh, sorry, that's the door, and, uh, and then go and uh, grab, the, grab the door briefly. Um, apologies for that in advance. That's uh, just one of, the, uh, one of the side effects of being locked down. If that's the, uh, that's the worst that we have to put up with, then uh, I think we should be think of ourselves as pretty lucky. Um, so we're going to talk about the uh, the SaaS journey on AWS. Um, probably uh, the the first question to answer really is uh, who the hell is this guy? Uh, what does he know about this stuff? Um, so I'm I'm John Topper, uh, the founder, CEO, and CTO of the Scale Factory. Um, I've been doing hosting and infrastructure things for the majority of my professional career, um, so pretty much 20 years. Originally in the ISP world, uh, and then through through a, a startup, uh, which was a, a mobile messaging platform that uh, looked a bit like WhatsApp, but was uh, in no way as successful. Um, 
which explains, of course, why I'm no longer doing that. Um, and, uh, and then after that uh, all fell apart, I, uh, I started the, the, the consultancy. Um, I have some certifications in AWS, if, uh, if you trust pieces of paper to, to say that I know what I'm talking about. Um, and my interest in general are infrastructure, AWS, and, and DevOps. We were a, a DevOps consultancy originally when we started. Um, obviously, that's not, not a word that is used as much these days, I think. Um, and we, we sort of refer to ourselves as an AWS consultancy these days. Um, but um, that, that's, that's my background, really, is, is DevOps. And you, you may have uh, seen me speaking at, uh, at DevOps events uh, over the last few years. I, I tend to get up on stage quite a bit um, uh, talking about those things. Um, the Scale Factor itself, uh, we're an advanced consulting partner within the Amazon Partner Network, um, or the AWS Partner Network, I should say. Um, we were a launch partner in the Well Architected program, and I'll talk a little bit about Well Architected later on. Um, we, we are a Kubernetes certified service provider, so if you are uh, one of the, the people that have decided to adopt Kubernetes for your workloads, um, we can probably help with that. Um, and we're also an HM government G Cloud supplier, so you can procure our services through the G Cloud framework if you're a public sector um, consumer or, or if you're selling to the public sector yourself. <coughs> um, we also, within the team, have uh, over 50 uh, AWS certifications. Uh, there are 19 of us in total. Uh, we're not a, not a large team, but uh, we're, we're, we're pretty well certified um, in, in all the things. Um, you can see at the top of that badge there, the, the word SAS. Um, that means that we attained our um, AWS SAS competency. Um, uh, and that happened uh, yesterday, in fact. Um, the, uh, the, the trophy arrived in the post uh, along with a, a tax bill from FedEx. Uh, thanks, Amazon. Um, and um, the, this uh, competency basically recognizes our track record in delivering solutions for SaaS vendors such as yourselves. Um, and uh, the, the, so the process of doing that involves us attesting to certain abilities within our team and, um, and then talking about some of the work that we've done. Uh, there's an audit that we go through with, a, with an external um, an AWS solutions architect to, to make sure that we, we're uh, not uh, lying about what we've achieved. Um, and uh, the, the competency itself launched yesterday uh, officially. Uh, was due to be announced at the uh, San Francisco summit uh, this month, but obviously that's that's not happened because it, it was an in-person event. Uh, but we're we're really proud of this, and you'll, you'll probably see uh, see us talking about this on social media quite a bit in the in the coming weeks because uh, um, it uh, it is quite an achievement. We're we're one of only two uh, UK headquartered partners um, to to have attained this uh, in the launch. Um, so we, we really are the, the, the people you should be talking to if you've got a, a SaaS workload that you're running on AWS and you're looking for a, a partner to help you build, uh, scale, or support it. Um, at the Scale Factory, we like to put people first. This is the team, um, or most of them. I think there were a couple of people missing on this uh, on this particular day. Uh, as I said, there are 19 of us, but we punch above our weight. We're, we're very efficient, um, and uh, the majority of the team is uh, is engineering and consultancy. We have a small admin function, uh, so we're a very technically oriented team uh, for the most part. Um, and uh, I think that, that shows in the work that we do. Uh, we've worked across the across the board with a number of uh, different clients um, uh, in different uh, different sizes and shapes. Not all of these are SaaS vendors, but many of them are. Um, the, you can see obviously the, the, the names that you recognize at the top there, Expedia and ITV. Um, and uh, the, uh, down the bottom there are some sort of uh, less well-known brands, shall we say. Uh, but we've worked in, um, in enterprises, as you can see, we've worked in, in startups, uh, in sort of SMEs and scale-ups. Uh, we've worked in the healthcare and life sciences sector. We've worked in the financial services sector. We've worked in e-commerce and media delivery. Like we, we're a very sort of broad, uh, we have a very broad experience base um, and, uh, and experience working in um, compliance and security regimes uh, that, uh, that some of you may need to conform to with the type of work that you do. Um, so the agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about tenancy options. Um, and uh, and then some uh, some AWS services that are that are relevant to uh, to the SaaS story in general. We'll talk a bit about security because security is really job zero and it's it's important for everybody at, at, at different levels. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about monitoring as well in, in the context of, of SaaS services and why why that's important. Um, when we are looking at uh, infrastructure. Um, we have a particular approach. The scale factory way is, is to uh, to put people first. So we, we uh, on average, want to make people's lives easier and not harder. Like um, everything that we do is is people oriented. Our team are obviously people. Um, you are people. Um, the the uh, customers we consult with are made up of people. The, your your customers are uh, are also people. Um, 
we we think of a human centric solution is is probably better than a technical solution every time um the uh matching solution to workloads um context really is everything so um we're not going to suggest a, a huge um undertaking um that is like you know military grade security if what you're doing is um you know selling crafting products online for example um so we understand your business context and we work to provide a solution that fits within that um we believe in leveraging the aws platform it leverages a kind of shitty words uh, that uh, that gets sort of thrown around as a sort of david brentism but um in in this case what i mean is is the literal uh, sense of leverage so you put a small amount of effort in and get a get a lot of output out um and um and i'll talk a bit more about that later um and we believe in automation. We grew up as a, as a DevOps consultancy. Um, so we believe in the DevOps principles of culture, automation, lean, monitoring and sharing. Um, and we, we automate everything pretty much uh, where, there's a, um, where there's no good reason not to. Um, that's, that's really part of our approach. Um, and we believe that um, change is, is inevitable. We're always going to be changing things. The idea that you can build a single solution and have it stand forever as it is, is, uh, is not really accurate. Um, and so we we work on the assumption of continuous improvement. Um, so we, we're we're always making it possible with the solutions that we build to iterate on those solutions and make sure we can improve them every time we we go in there and, and do some work. So um, that's enough about me for the time being. Um, let's talk about you. Um, so. Um, you as a, as a SaaS vendor will have um, a number of different uh, considerations around your product. So um, maybe you're a B2B or business to business play. And so you're selling your solution, um, maybe a smallish number of times to large customers, um, or perhaps you're selling uh, a B2C as so a business to consumer. Maybe you're, you're selling a, you know, a large number of units of your products to, to you know, millions of people. Um, and, and that's part of your business context and the decisions that you make are going to be driven by those sorts of considerations. Um, how many customers do you have is, is something to, to think about and, um, uh, <clears throat> and where are they? So um, the location of your customers is likely to inform things like what region you deploy into, um, what um, compliance and uh, legal regimes you need to be aware of um, and things like that. Uh, there's a question about how much they pay. I think it's it's important to understand your uh, the economics of your platform. Um, if you uh, if you know how much your customers pay, you can make reasonable um, decisions about um, the cost of delivering service to those customers. Um, so if you have millions and millions of customers and they're paying you know, a, a dollar a month or something of, of, of that nature, then the way that you think about the value of, of an individual customer and, and the cost of supporting them is going to be different to if you've got, say, five customers who are paying a couple of hundred grand a year. Um, so bearing that in mind is, is important. Um, and whether there are any, any regulatory considerations you, uh, in the UK and Europe, you're almost certainly um, going to need to pay attention to GDPR. That's, that's your sort of table stakes. Um, but if you're in the healthcare um, sector, you might be worried about HIPAA. If you're selling to the US, um, there are various things in the UK you might be worried about from a healthcare perspective. Um, we, in particular, worked with CFR 21 Part 11 through one of our um, healthcare customers. Um, there's, uh, if you're transacting credit cards yourselves, then obviously you've got PCI DSS to worry about uh, at various levels, depending on the architectural decisions that you make. So these are all things to think about when you're, uh, when you're looking at your product. Uh, and these are the constraints that you're working within um, when you're building your infrastructure. So if you think about um, the things that are going to be informing your architectural decisions, um, on the left there, you've got the customer needs. There's the things that, uh, things that your customers care about. So features and the cost and how quick does the thing run and what, how available does it need to be? Uh, what is the security uh, requirements of that, of that platform? Um, and so they, these are things that you care about because those are the things that your customers want to, want to um, care about. Uh, on the right hand side there, you've got compliance needs. So these are things that, that are basically enforced upon you from the outside. So things that, that a, a government or, or um, professional body or standards body cares about. And often those will include security. Um, there's uh, documentation requirements. There's probably a level of reporting requirements um, and probably some level of, uh, of change control uh, required. Um, and both of those customer needs and compliance needs are going to inform the architectural choices that you make um, and you have to do some of these things earlier than others some of the uh, 
if you're uh, if you're within a compliant market then you probably need to consider some of the stuff in the compliance landscape earlier than you might get to it if you were uh, if you were not in the in the uh, compliant market so um it's um it's often surprising to the startups that we work with when they are selling to uh, to kind of fintech and uh, the pharmaceutical industry and so forth um that they uh, that they have all of this extra stuff that they need to do and that there's a lot of effort that goes into it um there's often a significant um spend in terms of time and, uh, and money to to get to that place early um, and earlier maybe when when you'd like to instead be spending time building features you don't really have that choice in the compliant landscape so let's talk about tenancy um, and tenancy when we talk about tenancy what we're talking about here is um, every customer of yours is a tenant of some kind um, and the uh, the the nature of a SaaS service is that you are running a platform that supports multiple customers and therefore multiple tenants um, and Tenants, depending on your industry and depending on the product that you're building, uh, tenants come with different uh, assumptions or requirements about how separate they are from one another. Um, and there are a handful of different ways of achieving this, um, all of which have, uh, have different trade-offs. Um, it's uh it's often the case that for example one uh one noisy tenant might cause disruption for another and they want to you want to, to uh, limit the impact of that um you might want to uh for your financial services products demonstrate um to your clients that um one customer can't see each other's data and that you've made uh, made good design decisions to prevent that from happening so this is something to consider reasonably early on um and the, the range really is from, on the left there, there's the pool tenancy model, which is where you're using one set of infrastructure for every tenant on your platform. So you're sharing in this model, the, 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 the logos in this diagram, um, just to, to sort of fill you in there, the, the purple one there uh, is at the top is a, is a load balancer. Um, the orange stuff in the middle is, uh, is uh, servers, uh, I can't remember which which particular server I've used there. Maybe a maybe a Fargate cluster or something. Um, and at the bottom is uh, is database. So in the pool model, you see that everything is all tenants are sharing the same set of um, databases, the same compute nodes, and the same load balancer. Um, in the middle option, there is this uh, this concept called a bridge tenancy, which is where you might have some shared. Um, some shared components so in this model the database uh, is shared across all tenants um, but some per tenant um, infrastructure de deployed in this model here the uh, the load balancer and the and the computers are, is per tenant um, and on the right hand side there is a silo and the silo is um, where you have a completely separate set of infrastructure for every tenant um, and you can imagine that the that there are cost implications to this so on the uh, on the pool end obviously everything is is cheaper because you're you're reusing infrastructure across every tenant um, the silo is more expensive because you're you're not able to kind of share compute resources and so if you've got tenant one as busy and tenant two as idle um, you're still paying for um, two sets of, uh, of compute infrastructure for, the, for those tenants um, so that they're obviously more expensive um, but the trade-off is that with the uh, with the additional cost you get better isolation so um, in the pool model obviously your uh, your tenants will have data sat on the same databases that might not be appropriate for your uh, big pharma clients or your, your fintech clients your banks and so forth uh, on the right hand side there you're able to point at a database and say hey mr tenant one um, your data only exists on uh, on this bit of infrastructure <clears throat> so it's, it's much easier to make um, assertions about isolation there um, there's also a complexity trade-off. Um, the more things you have to run, the higher the level of complexity. So over at the, at the silo uh, end, uh, you're paying more to get um, additional isolation, but things are more complicated to run as well because now you have um, separate, uh, separate sets of infrastructure for every customer. And so you have to, if you're making changes uh, and those changes are versions, you have to make decisions about whether you're uh, deploying those changes to every tenant simultaneously. Do you have multiple different tenants all on different versions? Um, depending on the change control model that you have to conform to within your, your compliance regime, that might be a necessity. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things to think about there. Um, your, 
I mean, my general advice is to try and start with a pool tenancy model um, until you can prove that um, something a bit more complex is required um, because pool will always remain the most straightforward. It will always remain the most cost effective, um, but it might not always meet the, um, the isolation requirements of your workload. Um, so try pool as far as possible. Um, the other options are available as you go. Um, and when we talk about isolation of tenants, um, certainly in the, in the silo model, uh, this sort of complete isolation, uh, we have different ways of doing that in the, in the platform as well. Um, so at the, at the sort of lowest complexity, lowest level of isolation, um, you know, lowest cost and, and lowest usage transparency model, I'll talk about what that means, uh, is the application layer. So you're writing code in your software um, in order to, to deal with um, tenancy segregation. So you might have one deployment of your application um, and that application might uh, look up a, a tenant ID in a database and make decisions based on that tenant. So that, that's the sort of the most isolated um, you can get in the, in the software itself. Uh, moving up there, you could uh, isolate tenants by container. So uh, in solutions like Fargate or EKS, um, you can uh, designate a container as running the application for a specific customer. Uh, and then you kind of handle routing of traffic for that particular uh, tenant to that container using your load balancer or, or, or some other kind of uh, logic at the front of your of your infrastructure um, and the isolating by container allows you to uh, to put policies around that container um, using IAM but that basically enforce the segregation of that uh, that user so we do this with some customers where um, where cost is a concern but they want a level of, uh, of provability about isolation um, we might have for example a number of folders in an s3 bucket one per tenant we can now create an IAM policy um, that attaches to the container um, that restricts access only to the uh, to the path in the S3 bucket that relates to that particular tenant, and and so you get a a way of, of demonstrating segregation in the in the access control layer um, in a way that that might be sufficient for your um, uh, for your tenancy requirements, but is also less complex than going all the way up to separate accounts, uh, which we'll we'll get to. Um, there's uh, you can do tenant isolation in the sublet, subnet layer. So you could, in a single VPC, um, deploy a subnet or a, or a subnet per availability zone for every tenant and be able to demonstrate with uh, network access controls and security groups that uh, one tenant can't reach the data or the services of another. That's, that's an option. Um, you might also consider deploying a separate VPC per, per tenant. And probably if you're looking at subnet, tenancy vpc tenancy is is not a big step away from that um where you have a vpc deployed in a, one account multiple vpcs one vpc per tenant uh, and then you use the access controls around the vpc to make sure that uh, tenants can't see one another um, and then at the sort of highest uh, level of, uh, of isolation you've got the aws account layer so you might have an account that you create on a per tenant basis um, you might leverage something like um, a control tower to make it easier to, to create those uh, those other accounts. Um, but then you, uh, you we've seen this for customers who work in the financial services sector um, where their banking clients um, want to see account level segregation uh, in order to, to feel comfortable that their data is not um, is not being commingled with uh, with others um, so the um, the sort of trade-off considerations here are um, operational complexity we've mentioned so it's obviously more complicated to run multiple accounts than it is a single account with a with just application in it although in the application uh, tenancy isolation model obviously you're pushing some of the complexity into the code um, but that might be okay um, the uh, obviously the the AWS account uh, isolation uh, model is is much more isolated than application uh, isolation um, usage transparency um, I think is really important in a in a SaaS environment because you want to understand which of your tenants are um, using more resources than the others you've got to, you want to be able to segregate um, the information that you have about usage and be able to say um, you know customer one is using three times the resource of customer two for example uh, and use that to understand uh, how much value they're getting from your platform maybe to inform your uh, your pricing model maybe you are uh, in your particular SaaS model charging on a per gigabyte transacted basis or a uh, you know per per cpu hour um run basis and so you want to be able to model that it's much easier to see um 
different tenants using different amounts of resource in the account layer um, than it is in the application layer, for example, where if you're, if you're doing um, application layer tenancy, uh, you're going to have to monitor that usage entirely within your application. So you've writing code to achieve that. Um, and obviously you've got cost at, at the application layer uh, and, and the container layer, you're sort of sharing infrastructure. Um, and so your, your costs uh, profile is, um, uh, is going to be lower than the, uh, than the account uh, segregation layer, because um, in the account layer, uh, if your tenant is not using that infrastructure, you're still paying for it. Um, uh, you've still got databases running and so forth you're not able to kind of share those resources across tenants um, so it's worth understanding that um, the more segregated your your customer data uh, needs to be um, the more it's going to cost to run the platform and probably the more you want to be charging for that uh, that platform um, in your um, uh, in your billing as well um, so just briefly a sort of foray into a into a case study um, when I ran this slide deck in person, we actually invited uh, James from Accenture to come and come and speak. I haven't done that today, um, but uh, Accenture Analytics are a, um, are a, a fintech business that uh, provides information to uh, to market traders uh, about their trades, uh, and they correlate that with certain sort of social and, and personal pieces of information, um, so that they can say what influences uh, good trading on any, any particular day, and they can coach their coach their traders through that, help them uh, remove bias from from how they're trading by by giving them data to to feedback from, um, and so they're selling their products to uh, to banks um, and to hedge funds and, and other you know, financial organisations, and obviously those organizations don't want that data their data to be shared with anybody else's because there's a competitive edge there um, interestingly uh, within 30 days of the trade that that information becomes a public record anyway so the the security actually is only uh, required for a 30-day window for every data point but um, for that 30 days it needs to be kept very very separate um, and so we started looking at the at the pool model for them because that was the, the most straightforward that wasn't going to fly um, with the types of clients that they deal with and so we ended up on this uh, in this bridge tenancy model for them um, the uh, the way that we manage this for them uh, is that there are a number of, uh, of central central AWS accounts that manage um, things like log archiving and uh, and security, um, and we have some shared services in there as well that um, that don't need to be single tenanted. Um, we on a per uh, per customer basis uh, are stamping out individual AWS accounts um, for uh, for some of the things that we do uh, in that model. So every customer shares, uses some of the shared services uh, and also has their own account for um, for some of this stuff. Um, and uh, and so that's why it's a bridge tenancy model because we, we're mixing shared and, uh, and isolated uh, account services. Um, we're also using uh, different regions depending on where their customer is based. So the, the customers that are based in the US, um, their uh, single tenancy accounts are stamped out in, uh, in US East 2, um, avoiding US East 1, of course, because that's where everything's on fire all the time. Um, and we also provide uh, you know, test staging live um, accounts and we have um, a developer sandbox on a per developer basis. And all of this is managed through AWS organizations. Um, and in, in this case, actually landing zone rather than control tower, but um, uh, landing zone uh, allows us to create new accounts and baseline those accounts with config um, so that they uh, they all have the same kind of security setup and, and, and so forth. If you want to get, uh, get into sort of landing zone or control tower, um, get in touch after this there's a there's a lot of interesting stuff there if you're if you think you might want to run multiple accounts or if you think you are currently running multiple accounts and you want to uh, enforce a level of um uh, consistency and uh and governance over how you run those um then uh bringing those under a under an aws organization setup and a uh, and a control tower um configuration is, is worth doing we've, we've got some experience doing that for uh, for people um this is uh uh, a big hairy diagram showing uh, uh, on the left there what what goes on in the shared service accounts, uh, what goes on on the right there in the in a per <coughs> per customer account. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. I would, this is quite a complex infrastructure, but the, the the segregation of accounts is easy to reason about because we can point at an example of what's on the right and say to a bank, uh, your data is just over here. Um, don't worry about it. So let's talk about leveraging AWS services. 
I've already sort of talked about the the kind of uh, you know bugbear of using leverage as a as a sort of meaningless businessy word, <clears throat> but what I'm talking about is using something to its maximum advantage. That's that's essentially what we mean. Um, this is um, this diagram here is called a Wardley map. Um, you may have seen Wardley maps before. If if not, I'm going to give a just a brief overview on what what this means. Um, so in a Wardley map, what, what we're looking at is um, from top to bottom the value chain. So um, at the top of a Wardley map is always the customer or the user, um, and as you go further down. Uh, the the map um, we start to get to the less visible parts of the value chain so um, in this case you can see that the user um, makes use of some compute services um, and the compute services rely on power right quite straightforward uh, as a user you don't care what that power looks like where it comes from um, you uh, you just want to use your compute um, from left to right um, you've got um, Genesis through to commodity um, which is sort of the evolution of uh, of that thing. So um, if the thing that you're consuming is a commodity, um, as power is, because it's provided by the grid, you put a 13 amp socket in a, in a hole uh, and you always get you know, 50 hertz, uh, 13 amps, 240 volts, <clears throat> that is entirely commodity uh, as a thing. Um, if you were to, uh, to be um, creating something that generates power, then that would live in the genesis section. And over time, um, what we see in general, as you can see uh, marked out in this, uh, this diagram here today, um, things tend to move from left to right as they evolve. So um, in, in the past, we might have uh, custom built our, commute, our compute, um, you know, buying, buying components from, uh, from a vendor, plugging them together and uh, putting them in a box and racking them ourselves. Um, over time, thanks to vendors like AWS, um, computers become a commodity. It's, moving from it's moved from left to right there. Um, and essentially what we're saying is that things on the left are uh, time consuming and expensive, things on the right are maybe cheaper and, um, and, and don't take you any, any time to achieve. Um, this, uh, this diagram then is a, uh, a Wardley map of a highly available MySQL cluster circa 2009. Um, at the top there, the customer is, uh, is working with MySQL the database um, and um, in 2009 we were buying compute and storage as as products um, we you know put an order into Dell and wait for six weeks and have it show up in a data center that we had to drive to and then rack and, and stack and everything um, you know quite time consuming activities um, the data center is sort of a product ish because uh, they're all a little bit different uh, but the data centers provide networking and power as commodities because they are provided um, on that basis by uh, by vendors um, in order to run a highly available MySQL cluster in 2009 you would need some monitoring uh, you need some scripts for handling the high availability uh, management of the of the database um, and those those two things were typically uh, at that time uh, we download something some open source package and, and maybe uh, modify it a little to use so we were sort of customizing it uh, to, to make sure that, that it worked the way we intended it to um, and then on the left hand side there in the genesis section we were writing brand new configuration management scripting in order to configure all this stuff um, and so in the um, in the sort of business landscape uh, or the sort of resourcing landscape in in our teams we had people um, spending time and energy writing configuration management scripts we had people spending time and energy um, customizing configuration to uh, to to deal with uh, highly available mysql um, but all of that stuff uh, was to benefit the uh, the database there was no real customer value to the work we were doing in that that space so quite naturally all of that stuff has moved to the right um, and the equivalence today looks like this um, which is essentially just by AWS Aurora right that's that is a highly available MySQL like database um, that you can just use as a customer um, and it's a commodity we've, we've bought it from a vendor um, uh, you know you, you could buy it from another cloud or you can buy Aurora from another cloud vendor but you could you buy something MySQL compatible from another cloud vendor um, this is therefore a, a commodity item um, and all of that space now in the left where you, there's nothing going on in Genesis or custom um, that is now representative of the time that you've freed up for your development team and your engineers to spend time doing things that are actually valuable to your customers um, and so by adopting an AWS service 
um, where a lot of the high availability and the operational overhead is taken care of for you by, by that vendor, um, you are freeing up your own team's time to work on higher value problems. And that's really the, the, the sort of the benefit that we, that we present when we talk about uh, you adopting the cloud for things. Um, you're taking things that are um, non-differentiated. Um, so um, running a MySQL database is not a, a service differentiator for you as a business. Uh, and you're buying that instead of building it. Uh, and I, that's really powerful. That's why I think that there's benefit to, to adopting these services. Um, and if you look at the AWS product suite, um, there are a lot of different types of service that you can buy now. It isn't just computer databases. There are machine learning. Um, there's uh, there's VR and AR. Um, there are um, uh, you can even you can even stand up a satellite base station if you wanted to to download uh, data from your uh, from your satellites, uh, which I guess unless you're Elon Musk, you probably uh, are not doing in your business. But uh, maybe you are. What do I know? Um, really, what I think of the the message of this slide is that if you're if you're deploying software into AWS, if you're if you've if you've built something or you're downloading something off the shelf and customizing it, or even just sort of taking a a, a, a an open source database service, if you are deploying that yourself into AWS, um, then you've probably made a mistake somewhere because there is likely to be something in the AWS landscape that provides more or less the same uh, same features for less uh, less management overhead. So um, I can implore you to, to look at what, what is on offer in the cloud and consider adopting those services, even if you have to change your app a little bit to, to make it fit or change the way you think about a problem to make it fit, because in doing so, you are leveraging um, that cloud, cloud vendor uh, services uh, and freeing up time for your engineers to spend uh, on, on things that are actually valuable and will differentiate you uh, from your competition. Um, so things that are relevant in the, uh, in the SaaS world, um, Amazon API Gateway. So this is a, a managed API Gateway service. Um, actually, I think I have separate slides on each of these, so I won't go into, into loads of detail here. Uh, there's Cognito, um, there's SNS and SQS, um, which are uh, uh, about managing queues and, and, uh, and notifications. Uh, DynamoDB, which is a, a key value database. Uh, S3, which is an object store. You've probably come across that. It was one of Amazon's earliest uh, web service offerings. Um, and, uh, and Lambda, which is a serverless compute model. Um, and in fact, the thing that makes these interesting um, for me, beyond the fact that they are uh, very well aligned with the SaaS uh, world, um, is that they are serverless. Um, and, um, and what we mean by serverless isn't that there are no servers involved because obviously there are Amazon data centers the world over full of humming machinery running these things. Um, but uh, what it means is that you don't have to care about the server. You're not provisioning, um, you're not doing any kind of provisioning of or sizing of server resources. You're not running an operating system. So the case for adopting serverless in your, uh, in your SaaS model um, is that it scales with demand. So um, you're, you're only spending, you're only using the resources that you need at any one time. Demand is entirely, the, the provision of resources is entirely elastic with the demand that you're seeing. Um, and so you're paying for the millisecond of computes that you're using or the uh, gigabyte of storage that you're using and not for the remainder of the time where that compute is sat idle. So this is a really good economic case for serverless. Um, there's no traditional server maintenance. If you are, uh, if you're running your applications on Lambda, for example, um, you're not patching any any of the operating system components. There's no, uh, you know, Ubuntu or Red Hat upgrades to manage. Uh, there's none of that sort of traditional, um, what I like to call janitorial shit work, like kind of mopping up after systems. You're not doing any of that because that's taken care of by the fabric of the platform. Uh, and AWS are doing that for you, uh, which again means that the, the people on your team who would have been doing that janitorial work are no, no longer needed to, no longer, no longer need to do that. They can spend time on more valuable things. Um, and that's, that's really the message is that if you're, if you're using um, part of the platform that is um, run for you by other people, then you freed up human capital to uh, to iterate on your own product. So let's talk in a bit more detail about each of those services because they're kind of interesting. Um, so API Gateway um, is it, it's traditional these days, I think, to, for um, application builders to build single page applications in JavaScript that run in a browser or um, or 
apps that run uh, client side on the phone um, and that reach back into some kind of back end system using API calls, whether that's GraphQL or REST or something like that, um, we're not seeing these days as much um, the sort of generation of whole pages from application servers as we might have done in the kind of the old older school LAMP way. And certainly people who are building applications to work cross platform uh, are thinking very much about um, how do we build a, a data layer that is provided by an API server um, so that we have multiple different uh, presentation layers that exist in, in the clients that we run. Um, an API gateway is one of those things. Um, so if you're familiar with something like Kong um, or, um, or maybe a, a service like Apogee or, or those sorts of things, that these API gateways sort of covers a lot of those bases. Um, you, you can provision a, an API gateway um, by presenting an open API definition. So that's a, um, a uh, JSON, I think, object that, that uh, JSON document that defines your uh, API endpoints uh, and defines the data types that you're interacting with uh, using that uh, and so forth. And in, in provisioning your API gateway with an open API definition, um, a load of that stuff is just set up for you. You can have it um, uh, validate requests for uh, for type safety and, and so forth in the in the gateway itself, which means that your, your code has to work a bit less hard, hard for it. Um, API Gateway will also handle authentication and authorization, so uh, management of, uh, for example, uh, uh, API keys that um, that you might might be using to to differentiate between different clients or, or different users. Uh, API Gateway also provides quotas and throttling, so. Um, on a per API user basis, you can limit the amount of requests a user can can make of the platform, which means that that is again handled by the fabric and uh, of the platform, and not something that you have to write yourself, which would otherwise be time consuming, and you would almost certainly get it wrong. Um, result caching is a thing that API Gateway can do as well, um, so uh, it can reduce the amount of requests that hit your back end if you're correctly serving up cache control headers uh, in, a, in a way that suggests that you understand how HTTP works. Um, and uh, you can also do lifecycle management. So um, a single API gateway can run um, a, a staging environment as well as a production environment um, and, uh, and handle the, the lifecycle of, uh, of deployment of, of that as well. Um, and it uh, integrates directly with AWS services. So um, there are ways in which you can, without having to write any code or write any, any sort of Lambda glue, have API gateway place objects onto SNS queues, uh, onto SNS uh, for notifications or into Kinesis or, or so forth. Um, there's a whole bunch of integration there that is um, not only serverless, but also codeless um, because it's taken care of by how you define the API gateway. Um, I originally wrote this slide probably about six months ago. Since then, there have been a, a bunch of changes to uh, API gateway that I haven't um, fully caught up with myself, um, but the, there's a, a new me method for uh, providing HTTP APIs um, that uh, is reportedly simpler and more powerful than uh, than the uh, than the previous model. So, um, API Gateway is definitely worth looking at if you are writing anything that um, that talks API at all, because it can take a lot of hard work away from you. Um, again, it's very um, this sort of work is very undifferentiated, so giving it to the platform to run is uh, is a, a sensible thing to be thinking about. Uh, Cognito um, is a service that uh, a number of our SaaS customers use. Um, it's um, uh, it's a user directory. So Cognito lets you um, uh, either manage a pool of users that are sort of uh, username password pairs that you've created yourself, um, or um, you can federate identity using uh, social or enterprise identity federation services. So OAuth. Uh, SAML and so forth. Um, so uh, and and these uh, enter, these federation mechanisms are interchangeable. So your single application can um, can do uh, can be logged into using, for example, a Facebook ID or a Twitter ID or a or a Google uh, identity, um, and uh, all of that is taken care of by Cognito for you. They create. Um, uh, web page endpoints for that to happen and, and it, it takes a lot of the hard work about write, writing an application that involves um, identity in some fashion. Uh, it also supports MFA um, if, uh, if that level of security is important to you um, and uh, role-based access control um, so you can attach different uh, IAM policies to, uh, to different Cognito uh, identities 
uh, based on the pool that they connect from um, and use that to uh, to control which Amazon resources or which of your API resources you can get to. So you can use, um, once you've logged in uh, your application using Cognito, you can use the Cognito identity uh, to talk to an API gateway. Um, and so all of that is a joined up story, uh, meaning that you're not having to write all of that identity management glue, which is great. Uh, there's also compromised credential protection. So if, uh, if credentials from Cognito leak into the wild, um, it, that's identified by other security systems that Amazon run uh, and they can turn off that user so uh, thereby preventing your, your tenants from seeing uh, undue activity uh, with their own credentials. Um, we talk about uh, how application layer isolation works a little bit. Um, here we, we have Cognito as an example. Um, the, um, this is a, a diagram that's taken straight from, uh, from the AWS um, uh, documentation. Uh, essentially, your, your end user is, is going to use the app. In this case, they're, uh, they're a Salesforce user, and, and Salesforce is providing an OpenID Connect compliant uh, identity provider. Um, so they start using the app. They go and log into uh, to their IDP at Salesforce, um, pass that um, identity uh, into Cognito, um, and Cognito is uh, is returning. Uh, sorry, you're you're taking your Open ID Connect ID from Salesforce. You are exchanging that with Cognito for a Cognito token. So there's a concept of a, of a token as generated by Cognito that your application can then use. Um, and then you can take that token and you can talk to the AWS STS service. Um, and get back some temporary AWS credentials and then use those temporary credentials to access um, services within AWS. So in this model, they're using DynamoDB. Um, there is a, there's a cool trick you can use then. So in, in this case, um, your application is able to talk straight to DynamoDB without you having to have built any server-side application components. This is all managed through, uh, through the Cognito uh, identity relationship at STS. Um, so you see it's a really powerful way of, uh, of allowing your app to interact with AWS without having to write server components. Um, and there's an IAM policy trick that you can use here um, that you would use in this sort of uh, DynamoDB uh, model where um, this IAM policy is allowing DynamoDB actions against a DynamoDB table um, with a condition that is uh, evaluated based on a templated version of the Cognito identity. Um, and that's basically saying that that application, having logged in with Cognito, can um, put and, and query and update and delete uh, and write things in uh, DynamoDB tables that with a with a key that starts with the ID of that user. Um, so you've got access control inherent in what that user can access in the database. Um, a good use case for this is uh, is online gaming, where you might want to manage a high score table, where you can have the the application using its uh, STS identity that it's got because you've logged in with Cognito to write to a table in DynamoDB its score um, against a key that matches the ID of that user. Um, it can't then go and modify other user scores. Um, but you might also have a have a uh, policy that allows a read of all of the DynamoDB tables in order to to uh, pull out the the high score and display it, all without writing any any server code, without writing any lambdas, without running any containers, without running any servers. This is really powerful, and if you can shift your mindset of thinking about having your applications work like this, um, then there's a lot of stuff that you can achieve um, with minimal glue, um, uh, just by uh, by leveraging parts of the platform that work this way. Um, other services that have these sort of fine-grained policies are KMS keys. You might not be accessing those from your apps. Um, S3 buckets, so um, allowing, for example, a photo uploading function in your application. Um, you could have uh, that Cognito identity through IAM allowed to write to an S3 bucket that relates to that user or a path in that S3 bucket that relates to that username. Um, SNS, uh, so you can also put notifications on there uh, and you can get at secrets. Um, so you might use, for example, Cognito Groups to control access to Secrets Manager um, so that you can get database credentials for that user to be able to access um, uh, the MySQL or a, a Postgres database. Loads of stuff you can do around there. It's, um, serverless is a really powerful way of thinking about this. Um, and what you're doing by doing this is, is making 
a bunch of the security somebody else's problem. So this is the um, the shared responsibility diagram. Um, below the line is um, is the AWS landscape. Um, AWS will look after the security of the cloud. So they are physically securing the data centers. They're making sure that the compute is secure. Um, they're providing um, the the security of the network and so forth. Above the line are things that you need to care about. So you are, as a as a user or a builder, responsible for uh, security in the cloud. So you have to make good security decisions um, on how to uh, how to store your data, um, how to manage identity, um, how to limit access uh, to your applications and so forth. Um, so. Just by adopting the cloud doesn't mean that Amazon are doing all the security for you, but they do provide you with a lot of uh, a lot of foundational work and the tools to make good security decisions yourself. Um, I've got a whole ninety minute slide deck on uh, on designing for security. If you're interested in that, the, that webinar has uh, has happened recently, but will almost certainly happen again in the near future. Uh, so do get in touch if you'd like to to know more about the security story. Um, one good example of uh, use of Cognito uh, that we we've uh, Achieve for customers with a company called Social Finance. Um, social Finance are a, a non-profit social change organization. And they use technology to help charities and social enterprise uh, governments deliver better services and improve lives. Um, and this was a, uh, a solution that we, we put together for a, a service that um, managed data about um, uh, individuals, uh, vulnerable individuals leaving a care system. Uh, and the data was uh, was presented to local authorities so that they could see how they were performing. Uh, and there was some sort of central uh, organizations who could see all of the data and, and make, uh, make assertions about that. Um, in this model, we used Cognito to handle identity. So we had a Cognito user pool uh, managing uh, managing users um, we we also built the capability to uh, to allow local authorities who were using active directory um, to to manage their identities uh, to use that to log into into cognito uh, the application itself was a website um, a single page app running uh, running in the uh, with JavaScript um, and that uh, JavaScript interacted directly with, uh, with the API gateway um, using the credentials that they they'd achieved through uh, logging in with Cognito um, and that API gateway um, managed the access control such that uh, if you were from one local authority you could only get out data from that local authority it was all done on URL uh, URL matching rules um, the the code itself then uh, ran on a uh, on the EC2 instance, um, which handled a, a bunch of sort of pre-pickled um, data, uh, and we we also uh, helped them put in place a mechanism in the in the application such that uh, if the if the query they were making returned too few row too few rows of results, um, that. Uh, query was too specific and might have uncovered the identity of the individual to whom the data related. And so if you were to make a request that, that returned too few results, then you wouldn't be able to see that data. Um, the, the real benefit of this was that um, as well as the access control story, which we could then sort of point at all the configuration and say, Amazon's taking care of the access control based on these rules that we've that we put in place. Um, we also had uh, API gateway logging everything via cloud trail. And so we had an audit trail of, of which users had seen which data at any point. Uh, and that cloud trail log was logged centrally um, and securely into, S, into an S3 bucket that couldn't be tampered with. So um, the, the user that was writing those cloud trail logs could only write to or append to that, that log. They couldn't uh, go in and delete or, or modify it. So we were able to make some very strong assertions about the, uh, the safety of this data um, based on the fact that AWS components were, were managing a lot of the protection for us uh, and we were um, essentially setting the rules for that to, to take place. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about application monitoring because I think that the sort of logging and monitoring story uh, relates here. Um, when you're monitoring um, application in your SaaS environment, there's a handful of things that you want to be thinking about. Um, so usage is definitely a thing to, to be worried about. And this is, this is on a per tenant basis. So you want to be considering what resources every tenant is using um, from a cost perspective, but maybe also from an IO perspective or a storage or a CPU usage perspective. Um, and some of this is easier in the silo model than it is in the in the pool model because uh, obviously that that high level of segregation allows you to point at a single account and say everything happening in this account is for this tenant. 
Um, but it, this is possible in a pool model as well. You just have to do a bit more thinking about it um, by doing things like tagging resources, um, uh, categorizing data and so forth. Um, it may be the case that if you're building a, a pool model here, you need to build some kind of monitoring pipeline to uh, to gather this data. Maybe you're you're getting your application to spit out some metrics, or maybe you're using uh, CloudWatch for that entirely. Um, you might push all of that into Kinesis <coughs> or another se uh, service like that um, to to process that data and spit out uh, usage reports. But um, do think about monitoring early on as you're building for for a tenant, um, because the first question your your business people are going to ask when they start seeing your Amazon bill go up is, who's using that? Uh, what what how can we reduce that um, or how can we pass on the charges for that so think about think about monitoring think about um, cost models and how uh, how you might equate resource usage of your cloud platform to what you bill your customers as you build your service um, in terms of the service itself you probably want to be monitoring request rates so um, the, these are the sorts of things that you'd monitor in order to uh, to meet your SLAs um, and um, so defining what a what a reasonable uh, rate of requests is defining what a reasonable percentage of errors is uh, defining what your performance needs to look like um, and and be able to bake that with some certainty into your contractual agreement um, you want to be able to monitor those things um, so uh, without without monitoring things like errors and request rates you don't know if you're hitting them and again this is a, this should be a per tenant consideration uh, we did some work with one customer who uh, was seeing that one of their services was was really flaky throwing a lot of errors and they were worried about their uh, their SLA performance um, but their monitoring of that was very much it was uh, synthetic so it was based on uh, you know a, a ping every minute or every 30 seconds or something um, and um, uh, and as a result was returning a sort of big overall pretend number um, we uh, put some effort in they, they were using kubernetes we did some work on their ingress controller to uh, to monitor the uh, the requests that were coming in uh, for um, rate and performance and, and errors and we made sure that we were tagging each of those uh, logging items with the tenant that uh, that was making that request we were able to, to show them that they were actually exceeding their slas for a number of their of their tenants uh, but one or two were causing problems and we were able to use that data then to drill into um, where where the problem actually lay in their infrastructure and it turned out it was to do with the data that related to those tenants so it's really important to think about this on a per tenancy basis rather than just the service as a whole uh, when you're building a SaaS platform you probably want to consider monitoring human metrics as well right we've talked about uh, people first um, and there are there are metrics uh, that are important here as well so uh, user activity uh, is, is the customer are the customers using the service um, in particular during your uh, your kind of contract life cycle if you've got a, uh, a customer who is within a couple of months of the renewal date of their of their service and, and they're not actively using the platform you might want to engage some kind of growth marketing or, or, or some customer service help to to try and get them uh, using that platform so by the time that the contract comes around for renewal um, it's uh, it, it's demonstrating value so seeing what users are doing is kind of important there are a whole whole suite of different ways of doing this you've obviously got things like Google Analytics or um, uh, other, other vendors that, that do do some of the things sort of on the application side but this is definitely something you want to think about uh, and similarly help desk uh, load if you've got a, a help desk system where your customers can ask questions uh, then obviously the uh, seeing seeing who is asking the most questions uh, has a cost implication um, but also uh, you want to be using that to drive uh, improvements to the platform as well so if you can equate uh, your idea of what a tenant is from your um, from your application to the idea of what a tenant is as far as your help desk is concerned um, then uh, you have a sort of joined up view of the world and I think that's that's an important thing uh, to be doing from a DevOps perspective, um, the, the things that we're interested in uh, in that sort of side of the universe is deployment frequency. So how quickly or how often can you make changes to the platform? Um, what is the lead time for those changes? So how, how long does it take between a developer committing a change to their, uh, their, their source control to it being live? Um, in the event of a failure, uh, how long does it take to restore service? Um, and how many of those changes that you make result in failure of some kind. Um, and measuring all those things is, is kind of important because you benchmark that against uh, data uh, provided here by the State of DevOps report in 2019, um, which uh, ties 
um, ties these metrics to uh, basically software delivery performance in general. Um, and they found that a number of practices, um, one of which is using the cloud, um, and some of which is using automated CI, CD pipelines, um, leads to uh, higher performance on those metrics. Um, this is really interesting research. Um, it's published every year. There's also a book called Accelerate, um, which is by Nicole Forsgren uh, and also Jean Kim and Jess Humble. Uh, although N Nicole is the PhD who's done all the work there, I think. Um, the uh, Accelerate talks about um, the, the things that teams can do to help them uh, reach better delivery performance against these metrics, um, such that you can aim to be a, an elite performer, which obviously you all want to want to be. Um, so a, a, an elite, the elite group um, deploy basically on demand, so multiple deploys in a day. Uh, it takes them less than a day to get the changes out. Um, it takes less than an hour to restore service in the event of a failure, and fewer than 15% of their changes uh, cause, uh, cause failures. Conversely, a low-performing organization um, breaks their platform uh, between 46 and 60% of the time when they change something. You definitely don't want to be in that group. Um, and uh, if, if you are currently building uh, SaaS software and, and you feel like you, you might be benchmarked into the kind of medium and low performing group, please do give us a call because there are a number of practices that we can introduce very easily for you um, that will um, help you uh, improve your, uh, your, your change failure rate and your, your deployment frequency. Um, so just in, in sort of closing, um, I think you should be thinking about designing for a pooled tenancy model first. There are, I've obviously presented other options, um, but the pooled tenancy model is the most straightforward and most cost effective uh, and least complex approach. Um, so if you can design for that and build your application to assume that, uh, then you can go towards the, the other tenancy models later if you need. Um, but uh, but forcing yourself into multiple account tenancies um, is a, a definitely a, a kind of one-way trip to life being complicated. Um, and we've worked with a number of businesses who've built applications that have never thought about tenancy um, early on enough. And so they are stuck in that multiple account model and, and realizing that um, amongst other things, because it's expensive to run an individual tenant, um, they can't sell to the smaller end of their potential viable market. Um, and so they sort of seeking to, to change the way that they think about building their app so that they can run a lower cost variant of the of the platform for tenants with less money essentially if you do that design up front um you uh, you, you don't uh, get yourself into into a mess later so do think about that um please do leverage the AWS services. Um, I know there's a lot of sort of talk these days about multi-cloud and cloud agnostic. Uh, most of that in fairness comes from vendors who want to sell you a tool to help you be multi-cloud or cloud agnostic. Um, my view is that certainly if you are getting started as a business, um, you are going to move much quicker if you can, uh, if you can rely on, on the, the, on this platform existing only in a single cloud. Um, and beyond that, um, the, the, the idea of cloud agnosticism is kind of a lie uh, because as soon as you do anything in any cloud vendors platform, you, you hit things like the security model, um, which will always be um, cloud specific. Um, so don't worry about, uh, about cloud lock-in, whatever the hell that means. Um, make use of the services that the, the platform offers because that's gonna make your life easier uh, and free up more of your engineering hours for, uh, for differentiation activities. Um, do use the AWS security features. As I say, I've got another 90 minutes on security. There's a whole hell of a lot to think about. Um, in particular, if your teams don't know I am very well, that is a very good place to start. Uh, we run training courses on uh, on fundamentals of IAM, um, and so we can we can talk about how we might be able to help with that uh, if you like. Um, uh, but there are also uh, you know, detective controls and preventative controls, and, and all sorts of other things that uh, if you don't have uh, those turned on, things like uh, guard duty, uh, cloud trail, uh, so forth, um, you're not using uh, detective. Or, uh, or Macy or those sorts of things, then let us know. Uh, there, are, there are almost certainly easy improvements to make in that world. And thinking about monitoring as a, as a first class citizen, like do, do monitoring, um, build monitoring in as you build your app because um, adding it later is harder work and you're going to want the insights that it gives you, um, particularly on a per tenant basis. Do think about per tenant monitoring. Um, that is the, 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 big, uh, the big sort of gap between teams that can monitor and teams who are doing a job of monitoring in, in, a, in a SaaS environment is that thinking about tenancy as part of the, uh, part of the monitoring story. 
Um, so what's next? Um, well, you can talk to us about uh, consultancy. Uh, we do a lot of uh, consultancy work. Um, training. Uh, so we, we run a, a support and learning subscription, which uh, gets your teams access to, to our team uh, day by day on Slack to answer your AWS questions um, and a, a monthly, monthly access to training courses on things like IAM or Fargate or Terraform, um, you know, Git fundamentals, that sort of thing, very tailored to the types of things that your teams need. Um, you can talk to us about well architected, which I'll get onto in a second. Um, Migration, if you're building an application or if you've built a, a platform that is not in the cloud, for example, uh, and you'd like to start adopting some of this stuff, we can definitely help with that. Um, if you're building greenfield, like new infrastructure, um, we can help you avoid some of the common mistakes and we can probably get you there quicker than you'd manage on your own. Um, I talked about well-architected. Um, well architected um, is a is an AWS program that provides um, a set of white papers on good design choices. Um, uh, some of the language I've used today has come from that. Um, we it, it also provides a, a review framework um, to uh, to analyze your own AWS practice and see how well you're doing against uh, against the AWS uh, good practice standards that well architected documents. Um, you can uh, engage us as a, as a well-architected partner to lead one of those reviews for you. Um, the, the review tool is accessible in the, in the console, but uh, you get more value from a review if you work with us on, on that. Um, we are one of the leading well-architected partners uh, in the world. We've done over 200 reviews since April 2018. Um, you know, we, we are the, the, the experts in, in this area. Uh, if you book a well architected review with us um, and you then go on to uh, to use some more of our services, whether that is consultancy or engineering or or support and learning, um, AWS will provide to you five thousand dollars of service credits um, to help fund that activity. Uh, that five thousand dollars is available. Um, multiple times if you're running multiple workloads. So if you are running uh, a SaaS platform um, and that SaaS platform uh, also has a, a, a BI infrastructure attached to it um, to, to do analytics and so forth, those are two separate workloads. Um, if you're building a, a SaaS platform where um, you are fully single account tenanted and you have a specific infrastructure on a per tenant basis, and we can apply for that funding on a per tenant basis. So we, we have some, uh, some multi-tenant workloads, uh, clients that we work with where we've been able to claim you know, five, five figures worth of, uh, of well-architected uh, credits to, to help improve their platform. So if you're in that boat, you definitely want to be looking us up. Um, if you're a CTO or a, um, a tech decision maker, maybe a VP engineering, or you, or you lead a large team in a, in a bigger organization, um, we run an event called Breakfast Ops, uh, which happens monthly. Um, that's a discussion forum around uh, ops and infrastructure topics. Um, when, we are, uh, when we're allowed out uh, um, and before we were locked down, we ran this in our office, uh, providing breakfast, uh, was sort of morning discussion. Uh, those have now gone to online. Um, so if you are uh, in that demographic and you'd like to hear what other um, uh, other tech leads and other CTOs are doing uh, from an operation perspective. There are, there's often some really good insight in that. Uh, so please just drop me an email and, uh, and let me know if you're, you're interested in doing that. Um, so um, I think we are done. Um, if anybody has any questions either about uh, the, the content today or uh, well architected or breakfast ops or any of those things, then uh, please do hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window uh, and type them into the box. Uh, I will um, wait for uh, a few minutes to, to see what arises. Um, if you are, um, if you're Libya's at this point, you don't have any, any further questions and uh, thank you for your attention. Um, do stay in touch. You'll get an email tomorrow from, uh, from Zoom with, uh, with some details about the, the webinar um, and um, uh, some information about well architected and so forth. Um, please do feel free to hit reply on that email if you have any questions um, and get in touch with me directly. Um, I and the team will be, uh, be standing by to, uh, to help you achieve great things in the, uh, in the SaaS world. So no, no open questions uh, for the time being. Oh, there we go. How do well, uh, sorry, this is from Neil. Uh, thanks for your question, Neil. How do well-architected SaaS providers deal with data loss prevention? Is there an AWS service for that? Um, so um, 
yeah, data data is an interesting interesting question in the AWS landscape. Um, almost everything that you uh, that you store data in um, fits into that category of, uh, of above the line in the shared responsibility model. So you're kind of responsible for everything that goes on with your data. Um, the um, the data services pretty much all have some kind of um, backup option. Um, so RDS has uh, has automated backups. Um, that can be scheduled. They, they also, RDS will also allow point-in-time recovery um, because it, it keeps a replication log that you can use. Um, services like DynamoDB originally didn't have any backup provision, but I believe has a proper backup service now. Um, so uh, for the most part, each of those services you can look at and go, this is, this is how I'm going to back this up. Um, and you can make a decision about the recovery time, recovery point objectives um, about that based on the, the documentation in the in the product itself. Um, this is of course easier if you're using Amazon's data services, if you're running your own, um, for example, MongoDB, there's no, um, there's sort of a compatibility layer uh, Mongo service in Amazon, but there isn't an actual MongoDB service. So if you're using Mongo, you'd have to run that yourself and then you'd have to be um, Doing the doing the dance of making Mongo uh, snapshot or backup uh, on its own. Um, data exists in a single region by default. Um, if your um, if your disaster recovery planning um, incorporates the idea that you might want to uh, you might lose an entire region, which um, has almost never happened, um, and certainly not uh, not to, not at that level of totality, um, then you might want to think about replicating data that's been backed up to other regions. If you do that and that data is encrypted, there are some uh, some kind of uh, considerations to worry about as far as moving encryption keys around and so forth. Um, but um, yeah, there's uh, there are plenty of uh, plenty of things to to uh, to think about in terms of uh, of, of data loss prevention. Um, and really, it sort of it it depends on your um, on your recovery point objectives as much as anything else as to as to how you how you approach that. Um, but yeah, use use the use the services that the, that the cloud provides uh, where you can. Uh, hope that's answered the question. Thanks, Neil. Um, question from Azad: Will the recording of this talk be made available? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I at this point have not yet worked out whether Zoom will email it to you or not. Um, if, if it if they're going to, you'll get that tomorrow. Um, if not, uh, then please reply to the email that you get tomorrow and say, "Hey, can I get a link to the to the talk?" Uh, I will send you a link to the slides. Um, and that page will have a, a URL and a password to get at the recording for uh, for this talk. So yeah, thanks, Heather. Uh Any further questions? I'm going to give it another 60 seconds and then uh, I will uh, bid you farewell. Okay, looks like uh, no no more questions. So um, thanks for your attention and your time today, everyone. I uh, appreciate you uh, giving up part of your day to uh, to listen to me. Um, please do stay in touch. Um, you can find us on the on the internet uh, in various places, um, and uh, you can always email me, John at scalefactory.com. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, Twitter, like various various places. If you want to uh, search me out there. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, we have recently um, achieved our SaaS competency uh, with AWS. Um, we do hope you'll consider working with us on your, your SaaS solution. Uh, so please do get in touch uh, to, to find out more about how we can help. Um, and uh, if you are uh, already building stuff on AWS and you, you'd like a, a third party view on uh, on how well you're you're doing uh, against the pillars of uh, security operations reliability performance and cost um, then uh, one of my team can uh, can come and run a review with you uh, we we i think we've got eight of those booked this month uh, we've got room for a couple more um, so uh, if you're interested in that please do please do get in touch you can book those uh, on the website in fact there's a there's a button to choose a choose a good time for that um, thanks for your time um, Please uh, do uh, stay safe, uh, be lucky, and uh, we will uh, see you very soon, hopefully in person at some point. Uh, thanks for joining.